Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Mechanics Institute program online. Reimagining sustainable cities, strategies for designing greener, healthier, more equitable communities. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute. Now, for those of you who are new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and were one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary events, and our cinema lit film series. So please visit us online and also in person. Uh, the library is open five days a week. Um, after our conversation, we will open for a Q&A with you, our audience. And also, I'd like to mention that if you'd like to purchase a book, uh, Reimagining Sustainable Cities, um, it is published by UC Press and is also available at alexanderbook.com or one of your independent bookstores near you. So, what will it take to make urban places greener, more affordable, more equitable, and healthier for everyone? We have four experts in the field to illuminate and help us think about new models of urban design and development that will help promote our growth, our communities, and sustainability. But there's so many aspects of this, you know, land use and transportation and carbon footprint and issues of housing and ecology and restoration. And so we're very lucky to have our guest speakers who can illuminate um, how we can think about change and how we can, how we as citizens can also uh, make those changes. Uh, and also how this is going to affect human development. So I'd like to introduce our guests, first of all. Um, the two authors, first of all, we have Stephen M. Miller, who's professor in the Department of Human Ecology at the University of California, Davis. His previous books include Planning for Sustainability, The Sustainable Urban Development Reader, co-edited with Tom, uh, Timothy Beatley, and Climate Change and Social Ecology. He is the Switzer Fellow and winner of the Dale Prize for Excellence in Urban and Regional Design and Planning. Also, Christina D. Rosen is an Associate Professor in the Department of Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University in Philadelphia. Her books include Governing the Fragmented Metropolis, Planning for Regional Sustainability, and Growing a Sustainable City. The Question of Urban, Urban Agriculture with Hamil Pearsall, and also Planning Ideas That Matter, co-edited with Vishwa Priya Sanyal and Lawrence Vale. And then here in Berkeley, we have uh, two speakers. We have Louise Mozinga, who is Professor of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. She is a member of the graduate group in urban design of the College of Environmental Design and director of the American Studies Program of the College of Letters and Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. And she was named a Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor of Undergraduate and Interdisciplinary Studies in 2017. And she's a former associate and senior landscape architect uh, with Sas Saskia Sas Saskia Associates. I hope I got that right. <laughs> Sorry. And also our moder moderator, Christopher Jones, who is director of the Cool Climate Network, a university government industry partnership at the University of California, Berkeley, and a lecturer at the Haas School of Business. And his primary research interests are carbon footprint analysis, community scale greenhouse gas mitigation, and environmental psychology and environmental policy. So please welcome our four guests. Thank you very, very much, Laura. And thanks to the Mechanics Institute for uh, sponsoring this event. And thanks to Louise and Chris for being discussants and all of you for attending. 
Um, we are, uh, Tina and I are going to do just about a five minute reading from the book to start with, and then um, perhaps say a few other words, and then we will move into discussion, a four-way discussion with Louise and Chris. Um, so Tina, would you like to kick us off? Sure, thanks Steve. And um, thanks to the Mechanics Institute for hosting us. Um, so I'm just gonna read from the introduction and um, just to give you a little flavor of the book. So imagine a city where housing is affordable, where each home produces more energy than it uses, and where people from different class, race, and ethnic groups live nearby and enjoy each other's companies. In company. Bikes and pedestrians outnumber cars, the air is clean, and sounds of birds and children's voices can be heard. Green spaces are visible from every dwelling. Little is wasted or thrown away. Women, people of color, and LGBTQ individuals feel safe, respected, and empowered. Businesses make decisions based on their benefits to workers, the public, and the environment, as well as their own bottom line. Leaders focus on long-term collective well-being, and everyone collaborates in planning the community's future and undoing the wrongs of the past. Imagine cities and towns, in other words, that will be sustainable and equitable far into the future. This vision may seem impossible, a dream so far from today's reality that is not even worth considering. But something like it will unfold eventually, if for no other reason than, th than that if humanity is to continue on this planet long term, it will have to figure out how to live in such ways. Business as usual, BAU, as we know it from the late 20th and early, early 21st centuries is unsustainable. The only questions are how soon societies can move on to a better path how much damage they will do in the meantime, and to what lengths political forces will go to resist change. This book seeks to take sustainable city discussions to a new level by considering the steps needed to address the climate crisis, social inequality, racial injustice, dysfunctional democracy, unaffordable housing, and contemporary challenges. Past sustainable city books have often focused on topics such as green buildings, renewable energy, bike and pedestrian planning, and compact land development strategies. However, we want to go beyond those to explore more fundamental structural changes. Our belief is that it is necessary to reimagine institutional, economic, and political structures, what we call social ecology, in order to make sustainable communities possible. This reimagining will be a creative process, meshing changes in physical form with changes in policy, codes, institutions, and power structures. Hence, our use of the term designing in the title. Okay, and I'm going to take up from that with a couple other paragraphs from a bit later in the introduction. Some argue that sustainable development is an oxymoron, equating development with destructive, overly consumptive ways of living. Others view the term as static, connoting some impossibly idealized steady state of society. However, in our view, sustainability does not mean either continuing the status quo or aiming at a static utopia. Rather, it connotes a process of continually and actively moving in directions that promote ecological health, social equity, quality of life, cooperation, and compassion. The urban sustainability agenda has evolved greatly since planning and design professions began to embrace this concept in the 1990s. Planning for the climate crisis has become vastly more urgent and new emphases on urban food systems, safe and affordable water, structural racism, public health, and reforming capitalism and democracy have emerged. And I have a little, we have a little graphic here showing how these new interests have come into the professions and the professions have themselves of things like urban planning, urban design, landscape architecture, architecture have changed quite a bit in the last generation and are evolving fairly rapidly. Although the sustainability concept is often co-opted to refer exclusively to environmental dimensions of change, any meaningful discussion of it must include goals of social and racial equity and economic transformation, both within industrialized countries 
and between the global south and global north. Sustainability discussions must also address the structural barriers and injustices that to date have prevented the necessary level of action. For each sustainable community challenge, there is of course no perfect solution. But in many cases, cities somewhere in the world have pioneered strategies that can make a difference. We seek to outline these approaches in each chapter with the hope that political discourse can be widened to fully consider them. Best strategies for any given community or society will depend on the context and may mix together multiple approaches that have been tried elsewhere. But the first step is usually to acknowledge the need for change and then to identify possible solutions. In other words, to reimagine. And let's see how we're doing on time. I am going to just mention one other thing at the very end of the chapter. We are optimistic about the future. Generational shifts are underway in many countries. Generation Z is the most diverse and politically engaged yet. Its members have grown up knowing that their success and even survival depend on their willingness to address issues such as global warming and inequality. Intuitively, many young people know that BAU must change. And then each of us can look for creative action within our own lives, homes, and communities to reimagine a more sustainable world. Okay, I think that's probably enough reading because I think the discussion will be um, more, more interesting. I just want to mention um, the core message of the book, which is that it is time for a new generation of sustainable cities initiatives, which go beyond green buildings, eco restoration projects, bikeways, and other achievements to date to launch a creative design oriented era of structural change in urban systems. Now the key words there, structural change, bigger uh, fundamental um, things such as governance, um, how we conceive of housing, perhaps creating a new social housing sector, um, maybe taking human needs such as healthcare out of the speculative market, things like that are structural change. The process also needs to be creative and design oriented. The types of thinking that have gotten us into sustainability problems are not going to be the ones that get us out. Design is a creative process of manipulating forms, including institutions, codes, processes, systems, and patterns of thought. So hopefully we can explore that theme as well in our discussion. Um, and Lastly, I think we can all be optimistic, as I mentioned. Um, yes, there is lots of gloom and doom I saw. Uh, don't look up last weekend, like many of the rest of us. Um, and yes, things are not very bright in some ways, but in the long term, we as societies will deal with this stuff. The only question is how soon. Okay, I think that's enough from us. I'm gonna turn things over to Chris and let's hear from Chris and Louise. Thank you for that introduction. And it was a real pleasure to read this book. I wanna start off with my recommendation and uh, um, it was, it's just full of information strategies and uh, ways to rethink our, the way in which we engage with our communities and the way those communities are embedded in social, political and economic systems that also need to change. And uh, I was also struck um, at, by the very second, um, this is the third paragraph, and this is the, really the theme of this introduction. And that, that sentence is, um, you describe um, uh, this, uh, um, imagine this community where, um, you know, it is more sustainable and equitable and greener. Um, and you say, um, you know, this vision may seem impossible, a dream so far away, far from today's reality that eventually, that it's not even worth considering. And then you say, but something like this will unfold eventually. And I think that optimism is something that at least Generation Z needs. Uh, I think they have, are growing up in an era in which one catastrophe and one set of setbacks after another has unfolded over their lifetime. 
uh, what's starting from terrorism to um, polarization, to threats to our democracy, to climate change and experiencing a living climate change and through to COVID. And I think there is a lot of doom and gloom out there. And so if you could thread this needle for us, either both of you, um, maybe uh, tell us briefly what uh, a world in which that does not ad address structural change, a world that does not um, embrace these design changes, the reason, tell us why we can't, that is unsustainable. Can you explain a little bit more about how we cannot persist in the business as usual. I think this is actually the topic of the first next two chapters, um, a bit about um, how the world would unfold if we do not address this, these, these uh, structural and design changes. And then um, maybe why, um, you know, the bit of how, why you're, you are optimistic that we will overcome those barriers. Okay, Tina, you wanna have a go at that? I, throw the uh, to I mean, I, I don't know if um, I, I feel like um, we're all living through the world that that's unsustainable right now. Um, so, you know, if if you're happy with the way things are right now and getting worse and hotter and, you know, I mean, how many Americans and people all over the world have been impacted by climate? And, and uh, you know, you cannot hide from this. So I think that's, I guess for me, I'm, I'm less um, worried that people don't see how bad it is. I think one of the reasons that Steve and I wrote this book is we both te teach sustainable cities courses and we had um, felt there wasn't a book that was kind of um, optimistic enough or was giving good, good solutions. We felt like everything, I, I feel like I, the, a lot of the classes that I teach are so depressing, I can't even teach them anymore. So we were trying to figure out how do we, you know, how do you frame the problem in a way that is realistic, but it's also, but, but also shows that there are a lot of people in the world who are not happy with the way things are going and who are trying to make change. And there's a lot of good stuff happening in the world. So how do we amplify that and, and, you know, and show people there's another way. And I think that's really was our primary goal. Um, Steve, I'll flip it back to you. Yeah. Again, we prefer not to focus on the gloom and doom because I think anybody who reads a newspaper knows or looks outside the window on a day that smoke has obscured the sky you know, has seen this. But things are changing. Just to give a very minor prosaic example from my own field of urban planning. In the last year or two, a number of cities in the US and in fact, a couple states, including California, have eliminated single family zoning, which is a very prosaic nuts and bolts thing. But for the last hundred years, nobody thought that would ever happen. And, and they have also greatly reduced parking requirements. They realize we have a housing crisis and it's not just in the US, it's worldwide in many urban areas. Um, and we need to do some pretty visionary things to address it. And okay, redesigning our codes is one of those things. Um, there is a whole movement called the new urbanism which has come up with alternatives to the traditional zoning code, form-based codes. You know, there are pros and cons to each of these approaches, but um, this sort of creativity is happening. It just has not quite reached crit critical mass yet. So uh, equity, okay. We've all seen George Floyd and how many other, you know, uh, examples on TV or elsewhere. But I think we are starting to make, you know, we are raising awareness at least collectively on, on that one. Um, so we could go on, but yeah. the problems are big, but the solutions are starting to bubble up. I, I guess we, we have to solve these problems in order to, to continue uh, uh, as, a, as a species. And um, so I, I appreciate um, the, the positive uh, not only outlook, but the really deep set of tools that this book provides. One of the things I really enjoyed about it is 
each chapter of the book has a table of strategies. Um, and those strategies um, are all necessary uh, in order to, to, to truly live in, in more sustainable and vibrant uh, communities. So it is a resource that I, I hope people will come back to. Uh, the, the next um, uh, sentence of the book um, that um, Tina did not read is, the audience of the book includes all those who care about the future. So that, that includes you and, and everyone you know. And so um, there is a lot to digest here. Um, I, I was going through the strategies and, and I was, was classifying them into large structural changes. Um, you might call those you know, scalable changes, but they're really institutional changes um, and versus highly tailored um, solutions, or you may consider those design uh, choices and those design uh, do take a lot of effort at the planning stage, at the planning level and the city level, often what planners are working with is, is very locally oriented um, and, and highly, highly intensive. It takes a lot of talent, a lot of community engagement. And I think given that there are these large structural changes that need to happen, and there's also these, a lot of on the ground work that needs to happen, I think people can kind of get overwhelmed. Um, where do I place my efforts? So much needs to be done. Um, and if so for somebody who is kind of wanting to make an impact, and I guess this is really for all, all three of our, our, our uh, other speakers here, um, maybe somebody who's young, uh, who um, sees so many places where they could make an impact. I, and the book is very careful not to prioritize these solutions. And, and perhaps I, I, I don't know, what would you say to somebody who, who really wants to make an impact, but there, there's just so much to do uh, they're, they're not sure where to get started. Tina, you want to lead off? <laughs> um, sometimes I have to go and try to convince people to become environmental studies majors. And then the parents keep asking me, like, are there going to be jobs? And I keep telling them, you know what? Environmental problems is a growth area. And we really need some awesome thinkers out there. Um, I, I guess... Uh, you know, one of the things that I personally have kind of come to realize is that um, as academics, we don't really have the time to sit around and talk about stuff anymore. We kind of just need to get rolling and we can't, um, we can't hide, you know, like talking. And it, Steve and I met at an academic conference. And I think part of our frustration was like, hey, all these academics are just talking about the same stuff again and again and again. So like, how do, so I think, you know, how do you in wherever you're working or where, whatever kind of your sphere is, how do you figure out um, a way to be a little bit noisy um, and to kind of raise awareness? And sometimes, you know, that means asking tough values questions. I think this book, like we, we do talk about, you know, what is really important in society and, and how, how is, the, is the society that you're seeing, it, it, is that expressive of what we think it are, it is important? You know, are we prioritizing families and, you know, individuals and communities? Like, are we, are we giving people time to express themselves? Are we respecting them? You know, are we, so I think, I, I think that's the issue is, um, you know, and everybody is going to need a space to kind of be comfortable sharing their knowledge. Um, and, but the, the there's, there's room for everybody in this, mm. you know, like there's, there's so much work to be done, but there's not time to sit on the, on the sidelines. So if you have, if you have a sense that the world shouldn't be this way and we're not making the right decisions, then you need to hop in there and, and, and start speaking loudly. That's kind of where I think we need to be right now. Let me add one more thing uh, to my question, and because the, just playing off what you've said, Tina, um, sometimes, well, at, at the Cool Climate Network that I, where I work, um, we develop tools at all spheres of influence. So maybe, um, I don't know, Steve and Luis, you could chime in, um, you know, for people who are listening in the audience, you know, we act at individual scales, interpersonal scales, at organizations, through our organizations, our business or nonprofits or wherever we are, at our community level. 
and then the public's policy, uh, you know, kind of realm, and even a higher realm, which may be kind of disruptive realm, like what can I do that, to change the existing system? And um, not only do people have to think about those spheres of influence, but they also have to think like, where am I going to direct, you know, within all the possible ways that I could interact within those spheres of influence? Um, and I think it'd be really kind of confusing for, for, for students, young people to figure out, look, where do I fit in? What, what, you know, what, what can I do to be, to be really impactful and how do I choose? How, how do you approach that? I'm going to respond to that really quickly and then I'd love to get Louise into this. Um, in the 1970s, there used to be this bumper sticker, which maybe some of the older folks in the audience remember, think globally, act locally. Well, that was great for the time. But I think we really need to think at many different scales how things relate, um, and we need to act, you know, wherever we can, and not beat ourselves up too much that we can't act everywhere. But, you know, maybe we can do stuff at our home or our yard or our street or our neighborhood or our workplace or, you know, our neighbor, our city. Um, or maybe we have a bigger picture job, or maybe we decide we have certain skills and we want to slot ourselves to be a chief sustainability officer for a Fortune 500 corporation. I mean, that is a position that didn't exist 20, 25 years ago, but every big company has one now. Um, uh, when I was graduating college, I got on a train, went to Washington, DC and became a lobbyist for doing coordinating behind the scenes campaigns in Congress um, for a nonprofit. And then I later worked at a very local level in the city of Berkeley doing bike planning and stream restoration and various other things. And the latest things just on the UC Davis campus, we got our chancellor to agree to uh, develop a plan to end fossil fuel emissions for our campus. And so, you know, just wherever we are at different points in our lives, we can do different things. Okay, Louise. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, I mean, Stephen, what you're saying is just start, start, get up, get up out, you know, wherever you are, there is something to do in front of you, mm -hmm. do it. It is not that complicated, actually. Figure out what's in front of you, what is in your realm and do it. <laughs> I, I, I just can't, you know, just pick up one thing and do it and then do the next thing and then get somebody else to do it with you. And then that's the way change happens. I mean, I am exasperated. We don't know what to do. Yes, we do. Actually, Stephen and, and, and Tina, I think one of the great things about your book is that we tend to teach and to write about and, and whether in academics or in journalism or to talk about on you know, various talking heads forums or podcasts or whatever, we tend to talk about social justice over here. And then we talk about green infrastructure over here and we talk about land use over here and so forth. And I think the great strength of your book is that you try to bring examples about all of those things together and show how they're interconnected. And anybody who's trying to understand, you know, what sustainability, it, how it is operationalized, actually your book is very revealing because you understand what social justice means in terms of not just housing, which is where we sometimes you sort of narrowly think about it, but what does it mean in terms of public space or land use or green infrastructure um, or you know a, 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 a traffic. Um, I think one of the one of like one of the things that, for instance, you was I thought was really interesting is you talked about the trade off in a new transportation system as we have mobility, which is extremely attractive, right? Mobility is extremely attractive, right? Though individual, we buzz around how we want to, and then you talked about access. And I thought that that was a terrific sort of trade-off. Okay, you might lose individual mobility, but you have access in a more dense, complex city to many, many more things within a very short sort of realm. And I think that there are several examples in your book where you sort of, you, you present, it's not just an optimistic vision, it's showing how people can live more easily, more 
at ease in the world through doing some of these things together. So one, the kind of array of interconnected mm -hmm. things that you're talking about in the book is really excellent. The other thing is that it's about living better in a very kind of everyday sort of way. And you reiterate that throughout the book, which I think is really, really, really important and um, really good. And, you know, I think that we as people who care about this thing, you know, we sort of fret, where do we start? I don't really care about that. I think you just start where you are. And if you kind of understand the basic principles, which is what this book is trying to tell you, you will sort of find your way in terms of your own individual journey about where you, you know, think about this. One of the things I'm director of the center at Berkeley called the director of uh, uh, the Center for Resource Efficient Communities. And one of the first thing I did is I got funding to create a handbook for city attorneys about doing new, new innovative kinds of streets because I knew from working that you could come up with the most gorgeous, interesting, multi, you know, multimodal street that all the citizens were going, yay! And the city attorney would go, no, it's, you know, it's not been done before. There's no standards for this. There's going to be a liability and somebody's going to run into a tree and so forth. So we did, I, that's what I, that came out entirely out of practice. So I had an opportunity. I did something it's now distributed everywhere it's gotten covered in a lot of different realms because okay you come with an innovative design the city attorney going nye, 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 nye. here you go think about it this way dude and that's really they usually are dudes um and, and that's 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 what we have to do. We have to do what's in our own realm. If you're a lawyer, there's something to do. If you're a doctor, there's something to do. Um, if you work for a, a, a recology, there's something to do. I mean, there are, in every place where you sit, there is something to do in this realm. And I think that that's incredibly important. Um, so um, I don't, I don't want to sort of, I guess I have sort of given a speech, well. but anyway, I'll stop there and then we can talk some more. Speaking of doctors, um, I used to teach in New Mexico and we had a, an active living by design coalition there, which is a you know, public health type initiative to get people walking more. We worked with the doctors to have the doctors prescribe taking a walk to people and literally <laughs> writing that on a prescription pad. Yeah, th that is starting to be done here. You know, there's a whole initiative at UCSF around this about giving prescriptions of walking in nature, not just walking for exercise or walking on a tre treadmill, but walking in nature. Um, so this, you know, these are all small changes. I mean, it's kind of, you know, there's a, you know, uh, um, complementary medicine. I mean, I, I, I suppose that there are parts of the country where that doesn't exist, but in most parts of the country now, complementary medicine exists. And, you know, and it was one thing that, you know, some, you know, renegade doctors did and not so, you know, maybe not doctors were doing 40 years ago, were doing it on the renegade side. And now there's like centers for this, right? So, uh, you know, in, you know, highly reputable institutions and double blind peer reviewed studies and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, I mean, I think that we need to think about those, th that, that there's a very, there's a comparability there as well. And um, so I, I would just really say that. I mean, I, I, I would say that one of the things that we need to think about, I mean, and I go back to this mobility versus, a versus access, uh, access, which I wanted you, I mean, I want you to do kind of a whole chapter on that about how your life could be different. I mean, if I, if I asked for anything that would be different in this book, I would want a, a, a last book and a last chapter that said, okay, I'm a, let's just say, I'm a 63 year old woman um, who, um, you know, is, is so-and-so and how my life would be different if many of these things would be implemented. You know, what is my access? What is my, I'm a five-year-old, you know, Latino boy. How would my life be different? Um, if I'm a, you know, a 32 year old mother of two, uh, how would my life be different? I think that that's understanding the, what like geographer Alan Pred calls the daily path implied by your book would be so, so, so vividly better, <laughs> I think. Um, 
writing that down for our next book. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really, really important that you kind of take it down to the level of like what is in front of you, not just you know, I like your drawing, you know, that that's a wonderful, you know, perspectival view and so forth. But the problem of that is, it's actually up above. What is, what is my path through that? And how does it, how would it change my life? And, you know, rich people know this, already, right? All the perfect neighborhoods, you know, the Elmwood and Berkeley, uh, Noe Valley in San Francisco, um, all the, you know, they know these good neighborhoods, <laughs> you know, they know they have a piece of this already, and it's highly valued, right? The people, Albany and north of Berkeley off Solano Avenue, you know, they already have a piece of this and they're already valuing it. So why isn't that sort of everywhere? Um, well, I'd like to pick up on that. There's there's a a, a nice uh, drawing in the the middle of the book. I don't know if you can see that, but it's basically a vision of a sustainable community that has well connected network of streets and a mix of of land use types. There's an urban growth boundary. Thank you, Louise. A mix of apartments and there's renewable energy. Half the housing is social housing. Complete streets designed um, for many modes of transit, etc. And, um, and I think we find examples of this. I know that we have colleagues that have went, gone around the world and looked at these sustainable communities, um, but how um, do we um, not just have these little nodes or these little islands of sustainability, um, you know, uh, when we, what we really want to promote is, you know, change uh, at, at, at all levels for all communities. I mean, I think you could even have an, even more inequity, or at least, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem when only some of us can live this, this life and not all of us. And so I wanted to pull up, um, just looking at strategies in particular, I think one, one of the many, many tables um, that I, because people are asking about this already in the comments, well, what are some real strategies that we can look at? Um, I, I'd like on page, on page 230, there's a really nice table of structural change um, at the at kind of the, the higher level, um, and then there's local uh, public engagement. So I just want to kind of read some of these strategies, and I think these are strategies where all of us have some level of influence. And maybe to kind of I could get kind of some comments um, from the other speakers. Uh, the structural change level we're talking about things like. Um, uh, restricting lobbying and improving elections. Uh, we can all think about um, how relevant that is right now. And it's strengthening public oversight of media, educating ourselves to be good citizens. Education, of course, is a really big uh, topic. Uh, increasing transparency in government and reducing conflicts of interest. And then at the local public engagement level, there's improving public hearings so that uh, everybody is heard and that there's there's time limits on, on what people are saying and that, the, 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 that there's more transparency, um, making uh, engagement more interactive. We can think of like, I guess, discursive kind of democracy here where everybody's views are being heard, appointing citizen juries, um, using old and new media more effectively, employing participatory budgeting, which is a, a wonderful idea that hopefully that would be employed everywhere. Um, these are kind of structural kind of governance types of, of, of changes. And, um, but these do not exist in many places. And so is, 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 are these areas that are just critically, fundamentally necessary and important? And among these, I don't know, I, I, there's so many strategies here. Um, I have a, my own bias towards some of these. Um, do any of you want to highlight some of these that you think are particularly uh, important? Steve, you go. Um, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing this one at you. I'm, Lisa, Lisa's Are you going to let me start? start? Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm yeah, letting you start. You. I work a lot with students about strategizing their future careers and you know where they're going to go, how they're going to get stuff done. And the strategies vary for each person, depending on what they're interested in, depending on their own personality, what their skills are. 
Um, so somebody is a really good meeting facilitator. Okay, that's hugely important. And there are a lot of specific skills they can learn to facilitate public meetings and make sure that one, the cranky neighbor down the street doesn't dominate the meeting and prevent the affordable housing from getting built or you know whatever. Mm -hmm. But that everybody and that people who haven't spoken get in. And there's a whole set of skills that go with that, which are pretty common sense, but they're not what we teach necessarily in our programs. And, um, um, so, and then there are other types of things. Presenting things visually is really important these days. UC Davis has a visual literacy requirement for our undergraduate students because the world is getting more visual. We're all online and mm -hmm. simple graphics uh, can really convey ideas. So learning how to, um, and some people have great graphic skills and can do that. Um, other people are, you know, have other things. So, so it's going to vary, Chris. I'm resisting yeah. giving any pat and answer because I, I just don't think it plays yeah. out that way. I guess, I guess the reason why I bring this up, I mean, um, so a couple of years ago, I had a mid-career crisis, I'll call it. Uh, I've been calling it that. And that is, um, I realized when I plotted California's greenhouse gas emissions against the United States emissions, and I normalized them for the year 2000, and I also normalized them at the year 1990, and I realized that California emissions are kind of leveled off and were even going up in recent years, whereas U.S. emissions are going down. And here in California, we, had, we have 500,000 people working in, in green jobs. We have some of the most um, innovative policy and, and, and rigorous policy. We have cap and trade program, tens of billions of dollars, half a million people working in the green space. And I, and, and, and I fear that we're being really diffuse with our, with our resources and talent because there is so much to do. And I suppose if we had three times as many people in this space or four or five or 10 times doing 10 times as much work that we can make some good progress on these things. But I, I don't want our, I feel like we're kind of training people to be making one five hundred thousandth of a contribution to less than average progress on meeting these big changes, you know. So I, I maybe want to. Um, I think there's a people want to know like where what's really really important, and I guess maybe that really varies from person to person where yes. they have leverage. But also, if I can follow up on that one. Um, there are skills of thinking strategically how to make a difference. And again, we have an, a sustainable environmental design major that we started about six or eight years ago. And that's kind of one of the learning objectives, help giving people experience thinking strategically. Um, so if you're one example that always, I always loved, there was a couple in LA who just had a boring tract home in uh, somewhere in Korea town but they decided to green it and make it the greenest possible. So they, they developed the LA Eco House and they had school groups come and do tours through it and see how the water recycles and the banana plants grow and you know um, the energy is handled and so forth. That, that was a very small scale project, but they leveraged a lot of educational benefit out of it. Or some of, you know, some, maybe we, you know, what we just did up at UC Davis, we identified the person who had the power, the chancellor, we, you know, had 280 faculty and 1300 students, um, you know, communicate this message to him that we want a plan to end fossil fuel use. And mm -hmm. we got that. So there's different strategic levers, in different times and places, and we need to all gain skills of um, how to identify them and pursue them. First, though, I think you're mm -hmm. actually getting at something different. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, and I, I remember I did say I was going to try to be a little provocative here. So, so yeah, let me. Let, yeah, you know, so I, I think you're gonna... getting at something different, and I, I would identify this as one of the questions um, that I had about the approach in the book, which was um, there's a very kind of uh, I don't know, kind of facile marriage between community participation, government, and NGOs. And right now, I actually think the relationship between community participation, government, and NGO in California in particular is highly dysfunctional and highly wasteful. 
Yeah. And um, mm. you have, you know, you have do-gooders, uh, and I, 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 let me let me let me let me preface this by saying I am the vice chair of a board of trustees of an NGO um, in San Francisco. So I mean, I like I'm part of this. I may be part of this problem. I guess I'm saying um, is that you have uh, philanthropic money going towards NGOs who. Uh, don't of people who are extremely wealthy and don't pay their fair share of taxes, and so don't go to government. At the same time, government is, you know, at times unbelievably slow and exasperating, right? And you know, also very, very wasteful in their own ways. Um, you know, and and you know, I'm not. You know, I live in San Francisco. I actually don't live in Berkeley. Like, you know, we we pay the most per capita of any city in the United States by far. Do we have the? You know, I know that we're supposed to have the greenest city, but we actually don't. I mean, come on. Anyway, so the uh, you know it should be much much better. So you know, so that's part. And then you have community participation, which has been weirdly and destructively co-opted, right? So I, you know, that's one of the things you kept on sort of sort of circling around these three things as if they each are the intrinsic saviors in this sort of situation, but there are some really bad problems and their interactions are also not good. Um, you know, and I mean, I could point to specific problems and, you know, specific NGOs, but I'm not going to tattletale that way. But, you know, I, it, I think that that's, that that system isn't working. NGOs have been set up as this parallel kind of government, uh, government, and, and they're sort of in this, you know, they're in a kind of codependency, a bad codependency situation. Um, and then you got, you know, citizen participation in there stirring the pot you know, using it for usually much more kind of elite <laughs> nonprofit industrial complex. I agree. Um, you know, yeah. it, so, you know, so I, so that's, I mean, I understand yeah. you, Chris, that the, these, we don't have, we don't have governance systems. And I'm not talking about government system, but governance systems that are really functional. I think I only have Even time for one we last. Money, we actually have a lot question. of money between NGOs and and the government. Yeah, and th right. There's a lot of talent and resources out there. We we need to direct it and be strategic about it, as Steve mentioned. I think that was something that I th we haven't brought up is social movements. Um, the the book discusses Black Lives Matter, uh, Greta Thunberg's movement, and youth movements, and and others. Um, is there? Um, does anybody want to? Uh, chime in on 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 that last topic of, you know, we need to work locally, but also are is there a movement out there right now? Is, do we need a new move, movement? Is there one that that there are a few out there that are that are worth um, checking out? Tina, you get all the tough questions. Fossil fossil <laughs> free is is one no, I, yeah, that is I out mean, there. A divesting I, I, is another, right? And there's. I think we may need movements of people who are not afraid taxes. to call call out things that are wrong and that are not working and that's what you see you know in the incredible bravery of black lives matter and and greta you know you see mm -hmm. especially young people saying this is not okay we are not okay this system is not okay and and pushing for something different um you know i mean w one thing that i feel like um you know, I, I've learned is that if, if you think something's wrong, you're probably right, you know, so you should, you should like hang tight with that and keep going because you there and, and, and over time, people's ideas about things will change, but we have to keep pushing them to do that kind of change. Otherwise, we, you know, the, the there's like a, a lot of inertia in the system. So you need people to, to undo that. And luckily we have a lot of really upset young people and Black Lives yeah. Matter and COVID, you have these crises. So, I mean, I think one of the things about this book and we had to kind of go back and rewrite it a lot is that 
you know, we, we had written a lot of it before COVID. And so it's trying mm -hmm. to, and Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and thinking about how do we, you know, is it, what's going to be different after this? And I think everything's going to be different. So we, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to more movements um, and, you know, and that kind of, you know, and really having a new vision of a lot of people are very unhappy <laughs> with the way the world currently works. So like, it, it, can we do better? I think we can. I mean, I just like to point, point out that a, a really key thing, one of the things that I teach is, is actually the history of the American landscape. And we had a, a period of extraordinary change in cities. Now, we may now argue with what those changes were, but in the immediate, um, the immediate effect of those changes were actually dramatic and they were helpful to all classes of people and every race of people. And that's the progressive era changes in city government and infrastructure. It's very worthwhile to look at the alliances that built that, built that change. I mean, I know that, you know, I, I know about Flint, Michigan, and I'm not, be, I don't want to be sort of Pollyanna about it, but in much of the country, you open the tap and you drink the water and you don't immediately get cholera. Okay, and that was not the case in 1890. And it's certainly not the case in 1875. And the reason that changed is because of the progressive era alliance between industry, women's groups, right? Women's clubs, look into it, they were extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Young people, settlement house leaders, uh, the early kind of immigrant leaders and labor unions and so forth. And there was some self-interest in there. The interest, the, 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 um, the indus, industrial leaders when their workers dropping dead all the time, having to replace them. And, you know, there were a lot of, there was an alliance there. Some of it was self-interest, some of it was altruism, but it was an interesting alliance. And I don't know why people don't go back and look at that alliance that in a generation change, garbage collection, sewerage, water supply, um, any um, housing standards, any number of things. Well, I think we can build on that. I think Q similar to, go ahead, Steve, and then we'll go to Q and A, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to go to Q and A. Um, similar things have happened in different places at other times. Yeah. I studied Portland, Oregon a fair bit at one point, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's right. you know known as a best practice of American planning. Partly, some people think they're only the best at self promotion, but and they certainly have their problems. But there was a an alliance there of some nonprofits, some sort of good government, civic elite types, local farmers who were generally smaller scale, more family oriented than in California. And they got the home build builders in, or at least some of the more progressive home builders. So there was a political alliance in the mid 20th century that has led to 60, 70 years now of one innovation after another that kind of build on one another. Mm -hmm. And Carl Abbott, who's a historian of, of Oregon, uh, calls it the Oregon planning style. It's not unique to Oregon, that same different sorts of coalitions can occur other places. And this is one of the things I learned from being in Washington, DC for my 20s. You don't get anything done there unless you build a coalition of some sort. You have a bunch of different players um, coming at it from different angles. Um, I totally agree with everything you said about local participation, Louise. I think we need a new philosophy of that that does involve the public, but that keeps it short and focused and produces results. And having spent 15 years as a local activist in Berkeley in the Bay Area, I can give you lots of examples that didn't produce results mm -hmm. and that just burned everybody out and that didn't, weren't fully inclusive anyway. I mean, you can mm -hmm. never include future generations by definition and you will never get illegal, you know, your undocumented people out to public meetings. So we have to get beyond the idea that enough meetings will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's. Uh, it's it's time to move on to our Q and A. Pam Troy, our events assistant, will be reading off some of the questions, and we'll hear from you. Okay. Well, the first question that came up is by um, is from Malcolm Campbell, 
is capitalism itself sustainable? I would like to hear from each speaker on this. Okay, I'm happy to lead on that one unless you want to, Tina. Yeah, um, that is a super fundamental question. And if we talk about structural change, that's the biggest. Uh, okay, democracy is pretty big too, but um, um, there was a wonderful book edited in the late 1980s by Martin O'Connor, who I believe was teaching uh, at UC Santa Cruz then called Is Capitalism Sustainable? And on the cover, it was a photo of a man with an ax. He, he was growing, it was a tree growing out at his base and he was chopping his own, um, you know, trunk off. Um, capitalism may well do that. It may well scuttle itself. Um, we lay out two alternatives in the, or several alternatives in the book. Some sort of revision of capitalism is essential. Some sort of greater public se sector oversight and limits to the power of, you know, corporations and other things. I think we need a lot more work on alternative market-oriented economies that are, for example, all co-ops or all other types of non Wall Street organizations. And there are examples, different places in the world of that kind of thing. Um, I am, I'm going to punt on the question. I do think that at minimum capitalism needs to be hugely reformed though. And if we look at the influence of the oil companies over the climate issue, for example, you know that alone is enough to argue that it's not sustainable. Tina, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, mean um, I, I think we talk a fair amount about sort of thinking about alternatives. I think the, the, um, the kind of growth machine always consuming more and, you know, um, is, is clearly not sustainable. Um, so, you know, we have to figure out, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things we, we also kind of raise is this issue just of kind of consumerism you know like a lot of our economy is built off of always needing more and always um consuming more and you know is that it, it, you know it, it sort of reduces the human experience to the that of the consumer and um that's something that definitely needs to be questioned so yeah, I, I mean, I don't see it necessarily going away anytime soon, but I think there are some cracks and some lessons to be learned from more cooperative models. Um, and, and, you know, we should try to bring those, you know, community land trusts and, you know, other ways of, of um, you know, focusing more on, on, on people and not profit, so. It is chapter three of the book and it's one of my favorite chapters. So I really, I'm tempted just to, take a screenshot of this, you know, table of, of strategies. Uh, and they, you have um, three paradigms, seven emphases and si several city strategies here. So um, there's lots to discuss on that one. We have lots of interesting things going on. There's a whole degrowth movement. Um, anyway, right. Louise, you wanna get in on this one? Oh yeah, I mean, there's lots of models of, um, <laughs> you know, different, the uh, alternative versions, for instance, of GDP, right? So, um, uh, you know, gross domestic, domestic product, we assume that um, capitalist economies have to grow in order to stay healthy. Um, and that's not, I mean, that this is not a new question. I mean, economists have been thinking about that for a really, really long time. Uh, the, you know, the overwhelming sort of, um, uh, you know, a, you know, paradigm is that it, it is that of course they do, and, and so on and so forth. And that's not actually a kind of proven. I think that the choices are. are I mean, I see if you want to keep a market economy. Now, I'm I'm going to say also, I've been known to kind of get up at conferences and just sort of say, you know, I'm actually a communist, uh, but. Um, uh, so, um, uh, because I'm just sort of sick of sort of defending capitalism, but um, I'm not going to defend capitalism wholly, uh, but I'm going to say that there's basically two ways that you can control its rapaciousness. Um, it's before the fact and after the fact. And so the before the fact is about either breaking up large companies or 
um, not allowing companies to get so big as to be so incredibly dominant um, that then they determine, you know, everything that you live and breathe in, which, I mean, we are on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I, I'll point out the irony about that. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I'm looking at an Apple computer. Um, uh, and, you know, this is, I'm sure, you know, somebody's going to tweet or Facebook about this. Um, so understanding that I am wholly and completely enmeshed in this. Um, so can, you know, you know, can you break up companies and not make them so big? And the other is that you you tax wealth at a completely different rate than we are currently taxing wealth, which is sort of the, the, the Scandinavian model, uh, which is you force everybody to live simply because if you don't live simply, you're going to be, you know, you're going to give most of your money away anyway. So you might as well live simply and it just makes your life simpler and, you know, hopefully better. So, um, you know, that, that is, that's the other alternative within a market economy. I think that though there's another question about that, which is, I mean, and um, uh, how can I say this? Um, so it's interesting to me to watch the pandemic as it's unfolded for all the reasons that everybody talks about. Well, what's interesting to me is the way that we're sort of stuck at the 60% vaccination rate. And, um, and so, you know, because it's like, there's no question that vaccination would help you, yet there's 40% of people who won't do it. Um, and I, I'm not just, I'm not willing to sort of say, oh, they're just simply Trumpistas. I actually, I think that there's something else going on here. Um, the government hasn't cared for people for a really, really long time. Our society hasn't cared for people for a really, really long time. Uh, we haven't let people have access to doctors regularly for a really, really long time. And um, so surprise, people are not gonna go to the doctor or medical institution and get their vaccine, um, which was very different than when the polio vaccine came out. People were had much more access to doctors, actually. They, they may not have had insurance, but it was a totally different system. And, you know, there were still doctors that made house calls, for God's sakes. Um, so I, I think it's really important to understand what you need to put in place to have people sort of have a sense of collaboration and being in this thing together. Um, and, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, me paying the kind of taxes that I need to, you know, it, I understand better what it matters because I am actually taken care of in so many ways. So that's what I would say. Okay, the next question is from Adele Basic. How can we get average people in San Francisco to accept multi-unit housing? Every time a project is announced, people protest against it. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a wonderful book that uh, has come out recently by somebody who was a classmate of mine, actually, 25 plus years ago at, at UC Berkeley, Dan Karolik. Um, and I've got it here on my desk somewhere called Missing Middle Housing. Yeah. And... Um, he is making the case that um, there are lots of relatively small two and three story housing forms that have just been forgotten in the American development industry. Um, and these days we're either going for pretty big apartment buildings or single family homes. Yeah. And there's a whole um, spectrum in the middle there that look and feel kind of like existing neighborhoods, but actually do have multiple units in the same building. And if I think if we looked at any older city in the Bay Area or most cities in the world, we will find a lot of that. Um, so that's one way. Um, and another way is I think you just don't let the neighbors have a veto. Um, you know, um, yes, it's important to listen to neighbors. Yes, it's important to tailor the project to the neighborhood and get in things that local people need and so forth, but you don't let them totally veto the project because cities evolve, cities change, and we need housing desperately. Well, California did just pass a law that um, uh, requires cities to allow um, splitting of lots and um, adding secondary dwelling units on them. So it won't necessarily happen in the places that we want it. It may happen in the places that we don't want it from a urban infill kind of perspective, but um, 
that's one example. There's also a lot of yimbyism out there. In fact, some of the same people who promoted nimbyism years ago and realized that we're creating you know, seven jobs for every one unit of housing are now promoting yimbyism and realizing in the Bay Area we need to create more housing for, for all uh, a whole number of reasons. So our, there's a movement I think is shifting. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Are there more questions? Well, um, I, I don't see any more questions, but there was, uh, Laura did bring up something that maybe, um, maybe some of you can expand on this. Do greener streets and public spaces reduce violence? Yes, <laughs> Louise, Louise posted a response to that. Um, Generally, the consensus in the design fields, correct me if I'm wrong, Louise, has been that getting more eyes on spaces tends to improve safety. You know, there's probably some caveats we could make. But if you slow down the traffic, if you add, um, you know, landscaped medians and bulb outs and pedestrian friendly design and bike paths, you get more people out in the public realm. And, um, you know, nothing's for certain, but that is likely to um, make those places safer. Um, I think street design, let me just on the optimistic front, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we were all about widening streets and just building more capacity. And that area of design has totally revolution. Our, become um, totally changed. We have all sorts of complete streets and um, road diets and green streets and bikeways and all sorts of creative uh, effort being put forward on, on that front. So that's one of the more hopeful areas. And if you look throughout cities, you will find many of those. Yeah, the book I was talking about is called The Topography of Wellness. It's by um, Sarah Jensen Carr. Um, you know, okay. Like Stephen, she was one of my students. <laughs> Actually, I shared her dissertation. Um, but, you know, so I guess this is a little bit self promotion on my part, but it's an excellent book and it's gotten attention from the New York Times and a whole host of other places. And she talks about, about green and public health. And, um, and I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of work on this already and her own work about this. Um, there's some very specific work by um, Bill Sullivan at, at the University of Illinois, um, very specifically about green spaces and crime. Um, very, very rigorous statistical analyses, so, uh, you know, social science analyses of this. Um, and, you know, it, it, it sounds like it can't be true, but I mean, again, where do rich people go? <laughs> <laughs> they I, know how to make their neighborhoods safer. They buy up property in walkable neighborhoods that were built on years right. ago. Right. Well, that was a, that question was inspired by a New York Times article: "Green Streets Can Reduce Violence." So I just wanted to get your opinion on that. I also want to ask uh, Chris about yeah. um, the cool climate. Uh, calculators and how can we calculate our carbon footprints and, and what can we do as individuals to do that? And I know that your models have been used for government and different organizations and corporations. So can you just give us a, sure. a little heads up on, on that research and, and the techniques and how we can utilize it? Well, what we do is we try to understand what drives consumption and then look at that find spatial resolution, demographic information, housing information, uh, vehicle information, uh, energy prices, et cetera, weather. And we estimate consumption down to neighborhood scale. And what we find in the Bay Area is that many neighborhoods are very sustainable, particularly they're lower carbon compared to other uh, locations with the same income level. But so if you had you lived somewhere else in California, rather than say in, in downtown Berkeley or San Francisco, your carbon footprint will be much higher. But what we also find is a huge, uh, uh, like a five times difference in the size of carbon footprints, even within the Bay Area. So there are neighborhoods with very low carbon footprints, neighborhoods with very high carbon footprints. 
And the, the composition of those carbon footprints is very different. Some places it's transportation, some places it's food is the largest part of carbon footprints. So what you can do is you can go on to coolclimate.org and you can use the household calculator. And when you put in your location, it gives you the carbon footprint of a household like you in that neighborhood. Uh, and then you use the calculator and you compare yourself to that, that benchmark, that similar household. But there's also a policy tool. So if you go to coolclimate.org forward slash scenarios is a, a, a tool that I worked on with, with Steve Wheeler uh, and Professor uh, Kamen at Berkeley. And, and we came up with a, a, a rough policy tool. So um, you can put in any city in the state or any, any neighborhood even zip code, and you'll see which um, uh, policy intervention areas have the most uh, effect on reducing emissions. Some places it's, it's urban infill, other places it's a vehicle electrification, et cetera. So what we find is that the tailoring is really important. Um, but also the, you know, like kind of thinking about the book, you know, we've got some broad strategies here, but a lot of tailoring really is required. And so that's where kind of we need to understand, let's start with some good basic information, carbon footprint and inventory data should just be step zero. Basic planning tools like this should be step zero. Like let's start with a good, you know, like, a place and then from there we can start the discussion and, and start getting into the real action that's needed so thanks for bringing that up great uh, and also for the rest of you i'd like to hear like 25 words or less what strategy would you start on immediately what's your top number one from your from your point of view in your in your specific work and i am going to say meditation and art, because I think the humanities and personal awareness in all this emphasis on STEM in our society have gotten totally left out of things. I'm still working on green infrastructure and I think that's fine. Green infrastructure, okay. I'm gonna be say something totally different, but data science. <laughs> So I, I believe there's a lot of data out there and that we can put it in, in, in to work for, um, for, for good at very low cost. So scalability is really important for me and that's one way to do it. Tina, you're on, you're on mute. Tina, Thank you're on mute. Thanks, my, my kid was coming in. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, to me, the big thing is breaking down silos and just trying to think about um, problems more holistically. Okay. By the way, I put my email in the chat. I'd be happy to communicate with any audience member who um, has further questions or anything. Um, and I think we're at the end of our time, are we? Yes. So I want to thank everyone for participating in a, in a very compelling conversation. I know that it's such a huge topic that, you know, when we have a conversation like this, we just often just get on the surface. But I hope it stimulated everyone to start thinking in different ways, uh, to use the resources that we've mentioned, uh, to also purchase uh, one of the books, uh, Reimagining Sustainable Cities. Um, and also to look up our, the different uh, websites that we've mentioned in the chat um, and also see how you can contribute uh, and move your communities forward and also your politicians and representatives to, to get that, those bills and uh, into legislation on whatever level, uh, city, state, and federal. So I want to thank everybody uh, for a conversation tonight, and we look forward to more conversations on this topic. And uh, good night to all. Thanks and so much. to the Mechanics Institute. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Louise and Chris. Thanks so much.